storm clouds gather far across the sea. Let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful. Yeah. 
what a great way to start worship. Worship team, thank you. How about Tynan? Tynan Davis, thank you, dear. Awesome. You know, this is a very special weekend when we not only celebrate and enjoy time off and other things, but it's also a weekend when we remember. Remember that uh, there are many who have paid a price for the freedoms that we enjoy, and we are grateful to them and to their families. For those of you who have loved ones who have laid down their lives in service of our nation, we thank you because you are sacrificing by virtue of their sacrifice, and we appreciate you and all that you've done. Welcome to worship. Uh, for many of you who are back for the very first time, it's so good to see you. For those of you who are on line with us, we're glad you're there as well. And you probably notice we've got some folks visiting with us. Now, here's something interesting. I didn't know this before, but there are over 20 motorcycle ministries in San Antonio, and Michael Hutton has brought a bunch of his friends. Folks, will you stand so we can welcome you to worship this morning? We're glad you're here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and for the chance to pause and remember. And Lord, even in the midst of that remembering, we know that there is so much grief in our midst. We pray your help and your strength. And ask that you would be with us as we fellowship with you and with one another, that we would be strengthened for the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that can happen to a lot of us, and sometimes we don't even recognize that it happens until it's already happened, is we can begin to feel very unfree. We can begin to feel weighed down and burdened down by the cares of this world and by maybe the sin and the guilt and the shame in our past. And yet, as the song mentions, when we have God's Spirit with us, when we have the blood of Jesus who covers us, we have freedom from all of that. And so one of the things that we're going to do is we're just going to take a moment to remember that and to live in that by taking a moment just to confess our shame and our guilt and our sin. Just lay it before God and say, God, I need you to take this from me so that I may be free. And so would you join me and bow your heads in just a brief time of confession. Heavenly Father, we know that we're uh, far from perfect. We know we mess up every day in a bunch of ways. We sin in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. We break your commandments, 
And yet, there's so much more to the story than just the ways that we mess up. There's your perfection and your holiness. And there's your grace. It doesn't treat us the way that our sins deserve. Instead, it treats us with love and compassion and mercy and provides hope. And so, Father, whatever burdens we bring into this place, whatever shame and guilt and sin we struggle with, because we all got it, we take a moment of silence just to lay that all before you right now. So in the very last verse of the very last chapter of the book of Philippians in the New Testament, uh, Paul writes these words. He says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And then he says, amen. Because after grace, there's nothing more to say. After grace, there's nothing more for us to do because Jesus has done it all. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, here's the assurance that we all have. In God's sight, we are covered by his grace. And in God's sight, we stand forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's sing. Remain standing as we sing, uh, as we listen to our scripture reading today. It comes from John chapter 15, verses 9 through 13. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. This is the word of the Lord. Please join with me as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy
You may be seated. that can feel really shaky, that's the hope that we need, right? That we have a solid rock, a firm foundation. Jesus is our cornerstone. And no matter what we're facing, we face it with him and we face it together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Hey, I am so glad that y'all are here with us on this very special weekend as we commemorate a very somber weekend and Memorial Day. Uh, Thank you for joining us for worship to remember and to sing praise to the one who gives us hope. 
our Lord Jesus. Um, if you're here for the first time this morning, or maybe you've been here for a while, welcome. We are so glad that you are our guest today. Hey, if you have any questions about Concordia after the service, you can head on out the back, hang a left in the entryway. You're going to see a kiosk that says welcome. Stop on by there, ask whatever question you have, and we will do our level best to answer those questions for you. And then we also have a little gift that we'd like to share with you. It's just our way of saying thanks for being here and worship, and uh, we hope you come back real soon. By the way, if you're worshiping online this morning, we are glad to have you worshiping from wherever it is you are, whether it's in San Antonio. Antonio or Texas or somewhere else in the U.S. or maybe halfway across the world. We're glad to have you as a part of this service today. I also want to take a moment to say thank you for your faithful support of this ministry. You know, uh, your giving is the reason we can do what we do. And so if you'd like to give this morning, there are a few different ways you can do that. You can give using the Concordia app or you can go to the website, concordia.cc. Or if you brought a gift with you this morning, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, there are some offering boxes on your way out the door. They have crosses on them. You can just drop your gift right there. Or if you're worshiping online, you can just mail your gift to the address that is right there on your screen. You know, we're a church who loves to pray and uh, maybe you're going through a tough time and you need some prayer. If you want to send us your prayer request, we would be delighted and honored to add you to our prayer list. Just go to the website, concordia.cc slash prayer, and whether it's for yourself or a loved one, just type in your prayer request there, send it to us, and we'll add you to our prayer list. Or maybe there's something that is really heavy on your heart this morning. You walked in here, and you really don't feel free, and you really do feel shaky. We have some prayer partners who will be right here, right after the service. And so just come on forward right after the service and they would be honored to be able to pray with you about whatever it is that you're going through right now. In fact, would you join me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, um, we're grateful for the chance to be together today. And we are grateful that your son is our cornerstone. We stand on him and he stands with us because he promises never to leave us or forsake us. On this Memorial Day weekend, we are grateful. We're grateful for all of those who have sacrificed for this nation. And we remember and we honor those who have paid the ultimate price. Father, we also know that if it wasn't for Jesus, there would be a tremendous price that was paid and then that'd be it. We'd have no hope. But because of Jesus, we know that not even death is final. We know there's nothing that can separate us from your love. And so we thank you for that hope and that consolation on a weekend like this one. Father, we ask you to be with our nation, be with her leaders, be with those who are serving currently in our nation's armed forces. Protect them as they seek to protect us. Heavenly Father, be with our first responders, our police officers and firefighters. We thank you for all of the work that they do. Heavenly Father, be with our nurses and doctors. Be with those who are sick. Watch over them and bring them back to health. We know that your spirit can do amazing things. And so work through them and work in those who are sick to make them healthy again. Heavenly Father, we know that as we worship you, you promise to be with us. We thank you for that. We celebrate that. And we walk in that assurance. And we pray in Jesus' name. And now together, we pray the prayer that he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. 
these United States of America. We honor the soldiers who died while in service, men and women answering the call to stay ever vigilant to protect our republic because freedom does not flourish on its own. It comes with great toil and at a great cost. We say thank you to those who lived and died and to their families. Thank you for protecting these self-evident truths that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you for your love that compels you to action, fulfilling the words of the scripture. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Amazing, wasn't it? What an amazing blessing. So thanks. They can, I hope maybe they can hear. Maybe they can't. Tynan and the worship team, what a blessing this morning to be able to celebrate in that way and to remember. And uh, that's what this weekend is about. It's about lots of celebrations, but it's about remembering. Now, on the topic of celebrations, one of the things that I wanted to tell you about that I'm just so excited about is that on Friday night, one of the celebrations of this weekend was the graduation of our eighth grade class from here at Concordia. Now think about those eighth graders. After a crazy year that is different in so many ways, so many things that were changed in profound ways and lots of things that were missing, and for them to be able to graduate with their families and friends and uh, take that step as they move on to the next part of their educational journey, I'm excited for them. And I just wanted to mention to you what a wonderful celebration it was. By the way, it also gives me a chance to say to you, next weekend, on June 6th, we will be celebrating the faculty and staff of Concordia Lutheran School. You know, we celebrated our child care staff last weekend and the incredible work they've done. We need to say thank you to our faculty and staff of Concordia Lutheran School. So I'll save all of my, uh, my beautiful words for then, 
but I will tell you that they're amazing people, and so I hope you'll plan to join us for that. Also, I wanted to make mention of something else. So next weekend is the first Sunday of the month, June 6th. We'll have communion in the way that we've been doing it during this COVID-19 season. But then on the third Sunday of the month, we'll be moving back to a more normal sort of order of service and communion and other things. It'll look kind of like you remember it, if you can remember that far back. Uh, But that'll be a part of our worship starting on the third Sunday. I just thought you'd like to know that there's some changes coming that... uh, Honestly, I think you'll be happy about it and it'll feel more normal. So let's, that'll be terrific. So a couple of weekends ago, we began this series called Overwhelmed. And the idea of this series is that there are so many things during this, this COVID-19 15-month period with so much that's been going on, there are lots of times that many of us have felt overwhelmed. And it's for a variety of reasons. So we began by talking about when we're overwhelmed by conflict and how it is that that we deal with that, what we can do, what our options are. Last weekend, Pastor Zach had an amazing message talking about when we're overwhelmed with depression and what do we do. And one of the things he did is point us not only to God's Word but to those places where there are people and resources that can provide the help that we need. This weekend, we're talking about what to do, how we deal with the reality that sometimes we're overwhelmed by grief. I mean, that's what this weekend is about. At the heart, for all of the celebrations that happen, for all the fun and the food that goes on, the fact is, this weekend is a call to remember. And when we remember, we remember that there are loved ones lost, that there are lives that have been laid down for our sake, and there's grief there. But I will also tell you that that in addition to the grief at losing uh, those who've made that sacrifice for our freedom, in this 15-month period when things have been so different and all of our normal patterns of of dealing with and and focusing on our grief have been disrupted, there's lots of pent-up grief among us. You know, this morning, I, I want those of you who have loved ones who have made that sacrifice of their lives for the sake of our freedom and for our nation, I want you to hear our thanks. It's not just their sacrifice that we honor. It's your sacrifice as well. And we appreciate you. And if you are grieving this morning for any reason, for any circumstances of anyone that's lost to you, and you feel that sense of grief, I want you to know that I'm glad you're here. You know, God's Word gives us guidance when it comes to the idea of feeling overwhelmed. In fact, there's a a psalm that we have as sort of a theme for this series. It's from Psalm 142. I'd like you to read these words with me. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. That's what we do as people of faith. We turn to God and we turn to His Word when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel the, the press of so many things crushing down on us. And so this morning, we're going to to take a look. Again, whether you've lost someone in in the service to our country or you're suffering grief in any way, we're going to focus on that. And I want to start by just telling you about something that I learned. So this is also, this weekend is the 11th anniversary of the loss of our son, Nick. No way that could go wrong, right? But as we think about that, that whole reality, Julie and I, shortly after Nick passed away, we engaged a grief counselor. And one of the things that she said was, was really kind of a surprise to me, but it makes sense. She said, I won't see you for two weeks, probably more like a month. Now, it wasn't because her schedule was so full she couldn't make time for us. It was because, as she went on to explain, when you suffer a a tremendous loss, when you experience profound grief, it's almost as if you experience a concussion. Anybody ever have a concussion? I mean, it it rattles your thinking. It causes things to be cloudy. It, It sort of makes you not able to process in the same way, and it certainly inhibits your ability to remember things. And one of the things she said to us is, if you come before that period of time, you won't even be able to remember. It won't be any good to you. Well, you know, I know that there are people among us who feel like they have been c- concussed by loss, by grief. And so today we're going to focus on that whole topic. You know, it's interesting because in, the, in biblical times in the ancient world, 
Death was an, an absolutely everyday present kind of a threat. So just as an example, in ancient Rome, 40% of infants died in infancy. Children, in general, 75% of children never reached the age of 10 years old. But then add on to that all of the illnesses, all of the pandemics, all of the plagues that were experienced. They had all of the things we have, maybe different names, but death was everywhere. And then add to that the wars. So in one war alone, over a million people died in the first century. Death was everywhere. But nothing's really changed. We deal with death on an everyday basis as well. Now, we, we don't like to think about it, so we try to push it away, right? We try to avoid it with all of our might. So think about all of the healthy eating. At its root, what's that about? Well, it's trying to be healthier and live longer, push de death back as far as we can. We think about getting more exercise. What's that about? Or makeup or cosmetic surgery or a million other things that we could name. What's it about? It's about pushing aging, pushing death back as far as we possibly can so that we really don't have to deal with it because when we do, grief comes in and grief can be overwhelming. You know, that brings us to our text for today from 1 Thessalonians. And the reality is that, that the city of Thessalonica was an amazing place. It was one of the very prosperous sort of centers of the world. In fact, you know, if, if they had a list of best places to live, Thessalonica would have made that list because it was, a, it was prosperous in every way. But the reality is, it wasn't such a great place for Christians. In fact, Christians in the city of Thessalonica experienced persecution. In fact, Paul talks about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, you know quite well we are destined for trials. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way as you well know. What's Paul saying? He's saying, well, we said where there's going to be persecutions, and now you know exactly what we're talking about. But here's the thing. Those persecutions became more and more intense until Christians in the community of Thessalonica began to be persecuted to death. And so in chapter 4, where we're going to focus our attention, Paul is talking to these Thessalonian Christians, and he's trying to console them, trying to talk to them about death and about the grief that they feel. So chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You know, in that, Paul makes two really important assertions, doesn't he? Number one, he makes the assertion, grief is normal. You know, isn't it interesting how sometimes we try to tell ourselves that, that we don't have to grieve or, or tell ourselves that we don't have to be sad when someone we love dies. In fact, I've, I've had people talk about how a funeral service should be nothing more than a celebration. Dear friends, that's not real. Paul is making it crystal clear to us that, that grief when, and loss is absolutely normal. In fact, yeah, Paul says in the book of Philippians about his friend Epaphroditus. So Epaphroditus became deathly ill. They thought they were going to lose him. But Paul writes in chapter 2, verse 27, Epaphroditus was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. What's he saying? That God was merciful to Epaphroditus so that he didn't die from whatever he was afflicted with. But he's saying God was also merci merciful to me at the same time. Because had I lost Epaphroditus, I would have been covered in sorrow and in grief. And so God spared me. Paul's trying to tell us grief is normal. It is an unavoidable, absolutely normal part of life. But his second assertion is equally, maybe even more powerful. Christians grieve differently. What do I mean? Christians grieve, but they always grieve with hope. 
Paul is trying to remind us that, that with this hope, we don't have to grieve as if there's, there's nothing left, as if everything is lost. In fact, he goes on to say, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That because of Jesus, because of his death and resurrection, we can grieve, but we must always remember we can grieve with hope and with confidence. Think about it this way. When you and I are looking for someone to help us with a a big problem, with a complicated issue, we always look for someone who has had success in dealing with that kind of issue on their own, right? Right? We look for people who who know what they're talking about or know what they're doing. So just as an example, if you have to have surgery, how excited are you about going to the surgeon who has never done that kind of surgery before? Raise your hand. I just want to know who that is. Yeah, we want somebody who's done it a thousand times, who knows exactly what they're doing, and, and their success with other people bodes success for us. When it comes to a financial advisor, Do you want the the person who has had no success in their own life? Or do you want that person who knows what they're doing? They've been successful, and so you can put confidence in them. I mean, we think about that. In anything, in any place, that's what we're looking for. People who have been successful who can then pass that success on to be a blessing in our lives. And that's exactly what Paul is saying about Jesus. He's saying this guy died and he rose again. You can trust him, and you can trust that that because he died and rose again, he will bring those who have fallen asleep in him with him when he returns. He goes on, according to the Lord's own word, we tell you, we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, we will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, Jesus is coming back, and, and there are going to be two categories of people. Those who've died before he comes back and those who are still alive. And we need to understand that those who died before he he came back, he's going to bring them and he's going to bring us and we're not going to get there any faster than they do. He goes on. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive And left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And I love these words. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That's what I want to spend this this last part of time on, right? In the last moments of this message, I want to focus on three ways that, that we can find hope in the midst of overwhelming grief. You ready? Point number one, we find hope in the midst of grief because death is not final. It's not final. In fact, I love the the euphemism that Paul uses. When I say euphemism, you know what I'm talking about. It's a word picture, right? And Paul uses the, the word picture of sleep when he's talking about death. Now, think about this. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, those who've died. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you, we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul's using this word picture, so why is he using this word picture? It's intentional. The Holy Spirit is inspiring him to use these words to give us this picture so that we have a transformed understanding of death. And that transformed understanding of death transforms our grief. Grief is like a nap. Think about it. Death is falling asleep. It's like taking a nap. In fact, I want to be honest with you. So <clears throat> this afternoon, I am going to take a nap. Uh, it's in particularly uh, important because we have a new puppy in our house. It's not actually our puppy. It's, it's Katie and Eric's puppy, but we have them in our house until they 
until they get here and move back. And so we have this puppy in our house. How many of you remember what it's like to have an eight-week-old puppy? Yeah, I see lots of you. So all of you are sympathetic to the reality, I don't just want a nap, I need a nap. Now, do you think that Julie has any fear about me taking a nap? Except maybe that she's going to have to watch the puppy <laughs> besides that. Right? Because I'm going to take a nap and then I'm going to wake up again. See, we, we have this perspective from our temporal space. We have this idea of death that when we die, it's all over. It's done. There's nothing else. That's it. But the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to say, wait a minute. This is like falling asleep. It's like taking a nap. You know, when I think about that, I think about the mission trips that our young people have been on, and we've had some great trips. And way, way back, you know, when my kids were still going on those mission trips, I remember there was one young man who was on all the trips with us. And this young guy loved to sleep. No, wait a minute. No, I'm saying that wrong. He was passionate about sleeping. In fact, very early on, we learned that, that this young guy needed to have someone assigned to make sure that he woke up in time so he didn't miss the, the bus to the work sites or any of that kind of stuff. And so he was assigned this person to, to wake him up. And I remember one time we were in Portland, Maine for a mission trip, and it was my job to wake this young man up. And so how hard could it be, right? Right? And so we were sleeping, the, the men were sleeping stretched out all over this sanctuary, and this young man was sleeping on one of the pews, and so I, I sort of worked my way into the pew next to him, and I, I sort of whispered down, hey man, time to wake up. Hey man, time to wake up. Not even a flinch. Like, like it wasn't even happening. So, you know, I get louder. Hey man! Time to wake up. Still nothing. And people are beginning to gather. We know that the, the bus is going to be there, and we had to, to head out to the work sites. And so I decided, you know what? I'm just going to gently nudge him. Amen. Time to wake up. Nothing. Time to wake up. Time to wake up. Time to wake up. This guy doesn't even change his breathing pattern. Like I say, people were already kind of gathering around laughing and trying to figure out what was going on, and I'm, I'm giving up. I think he's going to stay there all day. I, I turn around, and I start talking to the rest of the team, and as I turn around and, and start to say, I don't know what else to do, I hear this, oh, oh, mm, ah. hey, is it time to wake up yet? Death is like taking a nap. Man, that changes things, doesn't it? Point number one, death is not final, and we can find hope in our grief because of it. Point number two, reunion is coming. And man, that's what we long for, isn't it? I mean, the, when you think about the, your loved ones who are not here, don't you long for the chance to see them again, to be with them again, to, to talk to them again? That's what we want. It's reunion. And that's what Paul is trying to remind us about. We're going to see them again. You know, Pastor Zach shared a story with me that was really powerful. So it's the story about a, a young man, Sergeant Jared Monty. And Sergeant Monty died in 2006. He was serving in our military. One of his troops uh, went down. He was trying to save this, this young man, and in the process of trying to save him, he lost his life. His dad and he were very close, and so his dad was grieving in a powerful way, and he would make trips to the cemetery. And when he went on that very first Veterans Day after his son had passed away, he was kind of shocked. 
because he expected to see the Massachusetts National Cemetery lined with flags to honor our fallen heroes, and there were none. Now, that may sound kind of strange to you, but there was a Massachusetts law because they were trying to honor those fallen heroes, and so they wanted to make sure that all of the mowing and all of the, the grooming of that cemetery was absolutely perfect, and so the law banned any flags or wreaths or anything else. Well, the dad felt like that needed to be changed, and so he went on a campaign, and ultimately, it was changed so that the flags could be post- posted there in that cemetery. In fact, tomorrow, this man, this father, and his team of people, this organization that he created, will, will place 77,000 flags in the Massachusetts National Cemetery. It's awesome, right? Here's the really touching part of the story. Tomorrow, when that father drives to the cemetery, he'll drive in an old, beat-up Dodge Ram pickup truck. Do you know why? Why would he drive a a beat-up old Dodge Ram pickup truck? Yeah, because that was his son's pickup truck. And whenever he drives that truck... He thinks about the times he and his son had in that truck. It connects him to the memory of his son. And it's powerful, isn't it? My goodness, we do the same thing, don't we? Our loved ones who've passed away, we have pictures of them. We have gifts that that we've given them or they've given us. We've got articles of clothing, all kinds of things. And and why do we have those things? Because we want to be connected to them because we long for reunion. Listen to what Paul says. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up, what? Think about the words you're reading. We will be caught up together with them. Don't you love that? We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. We will be with the Lord, and we've already been caught up together with them, and so we will be reunited with our loved ones. Oh, man, I love that. Reunion is coming. And so when we grieve, we can grieve with the, with the absolute understanding that death is like a nap. It is not final. We can also grieve with the understanding that while we will miss them and we will long in many ways to be connected to them, that reunion is still coming. But there's one more thing I want to remind you of. We can grieve with hope because we can be encouraged. Here's what I mean. To the whole reality of death and grief, God has added a secret ingredient. And that secret ingredient transforms death and it transforms our grief. Do you know what it is? God's secret ingredient is grace. Now, in case you don't know what grace is, let me put it this way. Grace is the reality that that God does not love us or care for us or, or give us life or give us eternal life because of what we do or because of what we don't do. So we get that confused sometimes, don't we? We think about whether we've lived a good life or whether we've lived a bad life and that somehow there's this this divine courtroom where all of that gets weighed out. But what the scripture teaches us is that you and I and every human being who has ever lived will be measured according to God's grace. And what God gives us through his son Jesus Christ is this incredible grace that, that has nothing to do with what we've done. It's all about trusting in him. In other words, what we get is not what we deserve. What we get is what Jesus won for us by his death and his resurrection. That's why we grieve with hope. That's why we face death with hope because God adds to death and he adds to grief that secret ingredient called grace. 
You know, it makes me think of a young man that I talked with several years ago. I was at the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod National Convention, and there was a young man who was a laid delicate, and he was, man, he did a great job. He was articulate, and he was thoughtful, and he was faithful, and he, he really, he spoke out faithfully for his church and for the, for the whole church body. Well, I know his pastor. And one time in between sessions, I was talking to this young man's pastor, and I said, wow, this guy, this guy should be a pastor. And that pastor looked at me and said, Bill, please tell him. Please talk to him. Encourage him if you can, because I agree with you. So you can bet I made a beeline. I mean, the next chance I had, I found this young man, and I was telling him about just how impressed I was and how articulate he was and what a great job he was doing and his passion for, for the Lord, his passion for ministry. And I said, you know, I really think, I really think you should consider becoming a pastor. Now, to this point, you know, he was, he was beaming and he was proud and he was excited and he was receiving all of this with a sense of excitement. But when I, when I said those last words, you should consider becoming a pastor, his whole countenance dropped. And he just looked down at the ground. And I could tell something, something terrible had happened. I said, hey, man, are you okay? Did I say something to offend you? He said, oh, no, pastor. But I've been to war. And if you knew the things that I've done, you would know that I could never be a pastor because God could never forgive me for those things. Do you hear that despair? You know, I know that there are people, either people in this room or people watching this service who feel exactly the same way. They feel like there's no way. They, they hear about grace and they hear about Jesus and they long for, for death and grief with hope. But the fact is they say, there's no way that's for me. There's no way for, that's for my loved ones. Except God adds in Grace. And grace is not about what you and I have done. It's about what Jesus has done for us. You know, I mentioned this was the... anniversary of Nick's passing. And uh, it takes me back to another mission trip. The summer after Nick passed away... It was in the middle of July, and we were in Crown Point, New Mexico, with a group of a hundred or so kids and chaperones. And we always have big worship service at the end of each day, but on this particular night, the power went out in the church where we were supposed to be worshiping. So our worship team adapted, and we went outside. And I will tell you, it was so awesome. We worshiped outside every night after that. But towards the end of the worship service, they invited people to sort of gather in small groups to talk and to pray together. I was kind of all the way back in the back of this parking lot sort of watching what was going on and checking on how people were doing. On that mission trip, my wife Julie was there, my son Mike, my son Jeff, and my daughter Kate. And they were up kind of in the front in the corner and uh, they had huddled around, you know how you do, you put your arms on one another's shoulders, and they were talking and praying. I will tell you that at that particular point, I was devastated. You know, I, uh, I was not only grieving the loss of my beloved son, but I was so guilt-ridden. You know, I'm the dad. I'm supposed to fix things. I'm supposed to, to figure out how we can move through all of this. And, and I was an utter, I mean, a failure in the worst possible way. I couldn't even bring myself to go over to my family. Because I knew that there's no way, there's no way that I should even be accepted by them anymore. It was in that moment that I had... Uh, a kind of an unusual experience. 
God spoke to me. And he said, Bill, you can do this. What he meant was just continue to shrivel up on the inside. Continue to be consumed by guilt and shame and continue to to be in agony about Nick. Because here's what I was really doing. We desperately loved our son Nick, but Nick made some big mistakes. He made some bad decisions. And what I was doing was really doubting God's grace. In my heart, I was holding on to a, to a fear that maybe that grace wasn't big enough to take care of my son. God said, Bill, you can do this. Or you can trust Nick to me. And you can go and love the people that you still have with you. You know, I was convicted. I realized that I, I needed to trust God in that grace of his. I needed to trust a God who loved Nick so much. He sent his son to die for him. And I needed to let go of that shame and that guilt and love that family. And so I walked over, and I will tell you, I still, I still was absolutely riddled with guilt. And as I walked over, you know, I didn't know what to expect. How foolish of me. Because you know what happened, right? When I walked over, they just opened up the circle and took me in. Do you know what that experience was about? It was about God's secret ingredient grace, undeserved, and yet more powerful than anything else in the universe. It transforms not just death and not just grief, it transforms life. God was reminding reminding me of his grace for my son, and my family demonstrated their incredible grace for me. That's what Paul is talking about here. He's reminding us that death is not final, and he's reminding us that that we can grieve in a different way. We can grieve as people who have hope. He's reminding us that there will be reunion. And then Paul, because the Holy Spirit inspires him to, Paul finishes with these words, encourage one another. Will you read it with me? Encourage one another with these words. That's who God wants us to be. People encouraged by his amazing grace and people who live that grace every day to the people around us. And so, dear friends, when we face grief, when we face death, it's not like the rest of the world. And because of that, we can bring hope to the rest of the world. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are grateful Grateful that you love us so profoundly that you can offer us something that we absolutely don't deserve and yet it's free and it flows into our lives and over our sin and our brokenness and our shortcomings and our shame. And it's so powerful. It changes us from the inside out that we become instruments, mouthpiece of your grace in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life.